but the concept for today that we're going to be talking about is interpolation. Uh, and this is basically showing your AI what to do in two separate scenarios and it figuring out to do in between those two scenarios, essentially. Uh, so I'll show you the first example of this, uh, which is what most people will probably do. I'm in the demo environment right now because um, I guess that's what most of you guys were used to over the past couple weeks. Um, so right now I just randomly initialize an agent, doesn't know what to do, it doesn't really do anything useful. Um, and then I'm going to show it what everyone usually shows it, which is to run towards the center. But I'm going to collect data in a way that's different than what you're probably used to. Um, and I'm doing this to intentionally show the concept of interpolation. Okay, so I'm going to hop into training over here. I'm going to put the opponent in the center. And so I'm going to start off at the end right here. And I'm just going to do that. I just collected data literally for like a split second and I just moved to the right. And I'm going to go all the way to the left. I'm going to do the same. Right. Um, so if I hop into inspect over here, you see that I only collected like three instances, right? So I was very, very like careful in terms of like only collecting like one one specific move. Right. I was at the edge and then I moved to the left. Then over here I moved to the right and then I turned off data collection. Normally what people would do is they would run all the way towards the center, right? And they'd start off at this end and they'd run all the way towards the center while they're collecting. To show it, basically, I want you to run all the way until this point. Now I'm going to show you that uh, we don't actually need to do that. Um, and you're probably going to get mad at me and say, why didn't I show you this earlier? Because you could have been training more efficiently. Um, but I, I often teach this stuff in steps. Uh, it's important for you to kind of collect the full data when, when you're starting, unless you actually know a lot of these tricks. Um, so I'm just going to end training right here. And um, of course, I am going to intentionally overfit just to show you guys the point. We only care about our positioning, right? Uh, and for those who don't know what this feature is, if we hop down into our positioning over here, it's basically what tells your AI it's X and Y positioning. So if I'm all the way on the left, it's going to be a negative one. If I'm all the way on the right, the X is going to be positive one. Okay? Um, and so this is basically going to, to tell the AI when it's on the left side, I showed it to run a little bit to the right. When it's on the right side, i.e. when X is positive, I showed it to run a little bit to the left. Okay. So I'll hop back into configuration. We're only going to train on positioning because that's all we care about for now. I'm going to bump up epochs all the way. Um, I'm going to turn down lambdas and bump up learning rate, okay? Because I just, I intentionally want to overfit just to show you guys. I'm going to train over here. And you're going to see something happen. That it's learning to run towards the center exactly how it would if you actually collected the entire data of running all the way towards the center. Um, but it learned that just by me showing it two little steps, one here. And one here. <clears throat> now you might be wondering how the heck is this possible? This is the concept that I was telling you guys about, which is interpolation. So you show the AI what to do at the two extremes, but then it figures out what to do in between those two extremes. Okay. And I'm gonna do some some math to kind of show you guys how this works. But that's the concept at a high level that I want to show you is that you can show it what to do in two separate scenarios and it figures out what to do in between those two scenarios. Okay, now um, I'm going to actually start doing a little bit of math here with me over here. Um, but I promise it's cool because anytime you learn why something works, um, I always think it's really cool. So I'm going to hop into auto draw over here and you see I have these other tabs. I'm going to pop into them a bit later to show you guys some some other different stuff. But let me um, let me just kind of like draw something over here for you guys. Actually, before I do that, one thing I want to explain is that, um, and I'll use a simplified example. Let's assume that we have one input, right, which is the x position. 
circuit. And we have only two outputs, right? Two actions that we want to take. One is to move towards the left, and one is to move, oops, one is to move towards the right. Okay. So this is our very simplified network over here. And to move to the left, we have a weight, let's call it W1. And to move to the right, we have a weight, let's call it W2. Okay. Um, so let's just let's just stay here for a second. Um, I'm going to continue to build on this, but let's start with this. So I'll draw a graph over here, and I'll say this is x over here. So in the middle, we have zero, right? Anything to the right of zero, right, is obviously it's positive, and this is negative, which is if you look over here, you can imagine the same thing. Imagine there's a zero in the center over here. Anything here is positive. Anything here is negative. Okay. Um, and over here, let's say, actually, I'll, I'll leave this empty for a second. I'll just draw a line up to here. And I'll actually draw a second chart low. Because we're going to analyze both actions it can take. And I'll draw this line all the way down here. And we have a zero. OK, um, I'm also going to draw a zero over here and over here. And I'll draw this line across. Now, this is not the y position. What this is going to be is this is going to be something that we call z, z1, and z2. OK, now. Um, I'll define it here. So Z1, right? Um, so it's going to correspond to the left action over here, which is going to be X times W1, OK? Z2 is going to be X times W2, OK? Now, why am, am I doing this? Uh, because in neural networks, that is the way that a lot of this stuff works, um, is that you have some math, which is basically some multiplication, right? Um, and then you have something that's called an activation function. Um, so that would be represented as follows. So like we have A1 equals some activation of Z1, right? And we have A2, which is some activation of Z2. Okay, and I'll explain what, specifically what this activation is later. But basically, all you need to know is that it's a nonlinear function, right? So it'll transform our line like this into something that could be like this, or it could be like this, um, or it could be like this, right? It the idea is though that it trans it translates or it transforms something linear into something nonlinear. Okay. We'll get back to that a bit later. But the, the, the first thing you need to know is that before it goes into the activation, there's a linear transformation that happens, which is just x times w. Okay? And so we do that for the left action, and we do that for the right action. Now, um, let's apply a bit of logic over here. So when our AI, when our AI is to the left, right? when x is less than 0, we want it to move towards the right. OK, so W2 corresponds to the right action, right? So when x is less than 0, that's when we want, um, what we basically want is we want z to be greater than 0, OK? Um, and here, right, to move to the left, it's when x is greater than 0. Sorry, this is z2 then we want z1 to be less than 0. Does that make sense? So when x is positive, right? Um, when x is, is positive, we want z to be negative. Over here, when x is negative, we want z2 to, to oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I messed up over here. We want Z1 to be positive. Um, so I'm just going to draw in here. 
Okay, so when x is greater than 0, we want this. In this case, when x is less than 0, we want this. Now, the reason for this, um, the reason for this is because when over here, when z is greater than 0, it means that z, hold on, let me, in this case, when x is greater than 0, what we want is for z1 to be greater than z2. And then when x is less than 0, what we want is for z2 to be greater than z1. Because ultimately, this is going to correspond to the probabilities. Okay? So, for example, if x is less than 0, right? So, if x is less than 0, so we're on the left-hand side, what we want is for the probability of z2, this, so the probability of going right, to be greater than the probability of going left, right? When x is greater than 0, so this scenario over here, what we want is for z1 to be greater than z2, right? So we want the probability of going left to be greater than the probability of going right, okay? So this is ultimately what we want. So we want to train a model to be in this quadrant over here when x is greater than 0, and we want to train a model to be in this quadrant over here when x is less than 0. Okay, so um, I hope this makes sense. So um, I'm just going to go over a few more things um, before I, I tie everything together. Basically, this, this activation function over here, it bounds everything to be within 0 to 1. It bounds the sum of all the outputs to be between 0, or sorry, it bounds, yeah, it bounds everything to be between 0 and 1, and it bounds the sum to equal 1. So for example, um, this is what it looks like. This is what the, it's called the softmax activation function. It basically turns the output into probabilities, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say um, A1, um, just imagine this is Z, gives us 1, and A2 gives us negative 1 over here. Then we'll put it through the softmax, and we'll calculate the probabilities. And this will tell us that the probability is 88% for the first action right, which um, in our case over here would be to go left, and it's 12% for the second action, right? So what exactly is, is this saying? So in what scenario would, would this happen, where A1 would be greater than A2? Well, it's in this scenario, when x is positive. When x is greater than 0, right, then there's going to be a higher probability of the first action relative to the second one. And you see that reflected over here. And if it was switched, for example, right, where um, the second action was higher than the first action, now the probabilities are swapped, and now there's a higher probability of the second action, i.e. moving right when x is negative. OK. Um, I said a lot of stuff. I'm just going to recap for a second. So um, in this scenario, we just cared about x the x position, right, which is the x position along, uh, along the stage over here. So that's all we care about. And we just have two weights that map to two actions, going left or going right. In our mind, the optimal thing to do, right, is when x is greater than 0, what we want to do is we want to move left because we want to move towards the center, right? Um, so what that means is we want z1 to be to be positive when x is greater than 0. When x is less than 0, we want z2 to be positive, right? But really, at the end of the day, what we care about is so long as z1 is greater than z2, that'll assign a higher probability of uh, moving left when you're to the right of center, essentially. And when z2 is greater than z1, then you assign a higher probability of moving right when you're to the left of center. Right. Um, so that is ultimately the objective. That is the thing that, that we're trying to do. Um, so 
I'm, I'm going to pause here for a second before I, I talk about how we actually sort of accomplish this. Um, but does this make sense? I think so in general. Um, there is some conversation and discussion between Frozen Sense and Jeremy. I'm not sure if there is a question here. Okay. I, in, I, I will tell you. Initially, Frozen Sense was asking. Yeah. Hmm. I think we should keep going. Uh, one, one question for you, just, uh, just more on the. When you. Um, your cursor, I'm not sure. Sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes it, like mm. we can see it, sometimes we can't see it. So when you're like um, hovering above the diagram on the whiteboard, um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't follow your cursor sometimes because we can't see it. So I'm not sure if there's a way to change that, but that was just like a note. Oh, um, hmm. not sure how to change it's that. Not, it's not a big I deal, but, I, but yeah. I know because I know you're probably hovering and circling your cursor around some things when you're when you're explaining it, but it's okay. Um, just, can you yeah, see what I'm doing really now? See. No, I think when it's outside of the whiteboard area, we can see it. But if it's inside the whiteboard, I can't see it. So, like, if you try to okay. go to the top, yeah. Now see now, see I can see it. Here, yeah. you can't see it. Yeah, oh, right. okay. That'll make certain things more confusing. Okay, I'll <laughs> I'll try and circle some stuff then. Um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully that'll help. Okay, no problem, no problem. Thank you for that. Um, okay, cool. So, let me let me tie this thing together for you guys. So, what we're trying to learn with neural networks is these things called weights. So, let's say we have W one and W two over here. Again, I'll just draw this line over here. Let's assume let's assume we started at zero zero, right? Um, we know uh, that essentially we want when x is negative, we want z two to be positive. So what does that mean? It means so it means that w two has to be negative, right? Because um, a negative times a negative equals a positive, right? So if so, if Z two, sorry, that's atrocious. It looks like two two. Z two needs to be greater than zero, then W two needs to be greater than zero, right? Because we want this to be the case that whenever X is less than zero this is going to be positive, right? So therefore, we need W2 to be, uh, sorry, we need W2 to be less than zero, right? Because negative times, a, negative times a negative is going to equal a positive, okay? And then it's also the case that it's basically the inverse over, the inverse over here uh, for Z1. So if Z1 needs to be, um greater than zero um sorry th this should be like when x is greater than zero and this should also be when x is less than zero um then we know that w1 needs to be greater than zero right because this is positive this is positive right positive times a positive gives you a positive and we can obviously see that in, in, in this quadrant over here. Okay, so what does that mean? It means W2, right? Well, we know W2 needs to be less than zero. Okay, so this is W2. We know that it needs to be less than zero over here. Okay, use another color. We also know that W1, this one over here, needs to be greater than zero right here. So we know that the weights together need to lie within this quadrant, right? Where W2 is less than zero and W1 is greater than zero. Okay, so now when we're actually learning, okay, we are going to move along a spectrum over here. 
Okay. Now, if we just start learning, we're going to start off over here, and it just moves a little bit over here, right? What does that mean, if it just moves a little bit over here? It means that W1 and W2 have a very, very, call it like um, small slope, right? The slope is small in magnitude. So what does that look like? It probably looks like something like this, right, where you're going to have something like Oops. It's something that crosses the center line like this, right? And then similarly up here, you can have something that crosses the center line that looks like this. Now, what does that look like in training? Well, I'll bump down the epochs a lot. Actually, that was that was that was too little, but basically something that looks like this, right? Where it's not as dramatic as we had before. It's still learning to interpolate, right? It's still learning to interpolate, um, but it's not nearly as dramatic. And what happens is the more that you train, the more you go along this curve, right? And the larger in magnitude the slopes get, and it goes from there to there to there. And now suddenly, you have a very steep curve. And when you have a steep curve, now um, it's essentially what, what you saw before when it looks something like this. Right? When you start making it more discrete. So even though it is very continuous, right? It is still continuous and it's interpolating. The more and more you train and the more steep this curve gets, right, the more um, that there is this almost like switch, right, versus if you remember when I didn't train as much, it was a lot more continuous than, than this. Um, I hope this is making sense, but the two things I really wanted to emphasize here is one, this concept of interpolation. I only showed the AI what to do at the very end, right, and because we're using a continuous function, right? We are multiplying this by some weight. What's happening is it's creating this like line essentially, and it's learning to do basically, hold on, I realized that you guys cannot see my mouse. <laughs> uh, and it's learning basically when I'm, when X is here, even though I only showed it what to do here, it knows what to do across this whole line, right? And that's exactly what, what you see. Right, is that not only does it learn to go right here, but it's learning across this whole line what to do. And as I get closer and closer to the center, right, now the probabilities start to even out. And why is that? Well, if you just look at this line over here, right, when you're very far, when you're very far from center, like let's say this point over here, and you draw that point on this line over here, there's a bigger delta between these two values compared to when you're closer to the center over here, right? Now there's a smaller delta. So if I go back into this softmax thing over here, and let's just say that we look at, for example, negative three compared to three, right? When you're very, when you're very far away, right? Um, Look at the difference in probabilities, like almost 100%, like 99.7% versus 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. Now the probabilities start getting smaller, right? 64 to 35. And if I go to 0 0.1, now it's 54 and 45. So this explains this concept of interpolation, right? Where when you're at the extreme, yeah, it's very, it's very strong that it's going to go towards the center. But as you get towards the center, the difference between this value and this value start to get smaller. And now the probabilities start to even out, as, as we see over here. But the reason why I showed you the steeper slope, and as you continue training, is that the steeper the slope gets, now the delta gets larger. Sorry, I also realized you weren't able to see my cursor. As steeper the slope gets, over here. Now the delta gets larger when you're close, right? So now instead of being uh, between, uh, I'll, use, I'll use purple. 
Now, instead of being between this value and this value at the same x value, now with the steeper curve, now you're comparing um, two different values, and the delta is a lot larger, right? So at the exact same x position, right, at this exact same x position, compared to before, now instead of comparing negative 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, maybe you're comparing 0 0.8 to negative 0 0.8. Right? Because ultimately, the magnitude of the slope or the magnitude of the weight got larger, which makes these end values larger. Okay, I said a lot. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, to, to, I'm going to pause to take an, any questions, but this is a very important concept, is that you have to understand why more training results in more kind of like extreme values. And it's because the weights are getting a lot larger. And so when it comes to the end probabilities, right, the values that feed into these probabilities start to get very, very different from each other because the weights are so large, right? And that's what happens when you continue to train is basically you move farther and farther along this line. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second to see if anybody has any questions. I hope this is helpful. A couple of questions here. Treefeed Xavier asks, does this work only for movement or does it also work for attack actions as well? It works for everything. And that's the next example I'm going to show you guys. Um, okay. Actually, should I just show you that now? Jeremy, yeah, what, one, one quick question. Um, a couple other ones hmm. coming in. Jeremy asks, what activation function are we using here? Is it sigmoid, relu, or other? Okay, great question. I wasn't going to talk about activation functions till later, but I might as well do it now. Um, okay, so we are using exponential linear unit for our activation function. Um, I'm going to pop into here. So I need to click on that. You, you guys can just see over here. So uh, in neural networks, um, we use these things called activation functions in the hidden layers. Um, and so if you, if you look at this example that I gave here, so, uh, hold on, let me, let me just get my, my pen over here. So we did a very simple example of, um, one input to two outputs, but really neural networks look something more akin to this right, where you have um, a bunch of inputs, right, like x1, x2, all the way until, like, all the way until, like, x, like, n, right, and each of these inputs feed into hidden layers, right, um, they're all kind of connected to each other, uh, so something like that, I'm not going to draw all the connections, um, but then you have these things over here, so like hidden layer, hidden layer one and two, and then you have sort of like your output, call it y hat. Okay, um, these things in here, this is supposed to learn something that's called a hidden representation, right? So it tries to essentially transform the data to make sense of it, and then finally at the end, it'll combine all the things it learned to get some output. Okay, and what we do in order to learn these complex relationships is that we apply these things called activation functions, which you'll see here, to transform uh, basically the process from a linear one to a nonlinear one. Because oftentimes to learn these complex relationships, we actually have to apply some nonlinear transformations because a lot of these relationships are nonlinear, right? Um, I'll actually show you a great example of this. Um, so this is a really cool playground environment for neural networks uh, that I think the people at Google made. Uh, it's part of TensorFlow, um, just to kind of show you really how cool neural networks are. Um, and so there's a bunch of things that you can toggle over here. You can toggle the learning rate, which everyone here is familiar with, uh, the activation functions, this concept of regularization, don't worry about that for now. We will cover that at a future lesson. Um, type of problem, so on and so forth. We can even switch the data sets over here. 
Um, but what what I'll show you is basically on this data set over here, uh, which is basically you have an outer ring and then an, an inner circle. And the idea is that you want the neural network to learn basically how to to classify these, right? It should be able to separate the orange from the blue. And I'll show you what happens when we start off with a linear activation function, i.e., um, if we look here, imagine we don't apply any activation functions. It's all linear things, right? It's just literally like x times w's, OK? What ends up happening, I'm going to start training, is that the model cannot learn the relationship. The reason for that is obviously because this is a nonlinear relationship, right? There's a circle over here. Um, and then there's an, an inner circle. So obviously, linear functions are unable to learn that. So I'm going to stop training over here. Now, if I switch my activation function to something like a, a, a ReLU, which is a rectified linear unit, and it looks like this over here. So basically what happens is if the value going into it is less than 0, it's just going to make it 0. And then if it's greater than 0, it's just going to be the, the value, right? Um, so it's basically just like a max of the value and zero. So if I apply this, now it's actually able to separate them. It's able to learn the relationship, right? Um, because it was able to uh, apply these nonlinearities, right? It's, it's able to not always com combine linear things. And, and let me show you exactly what that looks like over here. So I'm going to imagine we have imagine we have line A and line B, right? So if you imagine here, like let's say we had two features that I learned, right? This was feature one, this was feature two. When you try and combine these linearly, right? Like just add them up, for example you're going to get something that looks like this. That's clearly not what we want, right? It's when we're learning something as complicated as this, we, we don't want something linear. But what if we passed it through this activation function over here, right? Now, instead of it being a straight line, what it looks like is this. And if the other side looked like this. Now, when you add them together, right, when you use them together, now you start to get something nonlinear. And when you put a bunch of these features together, you can see how you can start making this shape over here to separate the blue from the orange. So that is ultimately the purpose of activation functions. Um, some of them are better than others, right? So for example, this sigmoid activation function, I'm going to start learning and you see that it takes a little bit of time. It takes longer. On average, this one took about 250 to 300 epochs to learn what a ReLU learned within literally like 30 epochs. Um, there is a mathematical ex explanation for why this is the case. I'm happy to get into it if you guys want. Um, but, um, but yeah, so this is kind of the purpose of activation functions. The specific one we are using is an exponential linear unit, which is similar to ReLU, except when the value is less than zero, it doesn't zero it out. It still has um, some negative value. Um, I don't really want to get into why I chose this, but, but I'm happy to if you guys are interested. OK, I went on for a while. I hope that answered the question. And by the way, I highly recommend you guys check out uh, playground.tensorflow.org. It is very, very cool for getting an intuition for how this stuff works. Is there any other questions? Or should I just go into showing the other example? Uh, I think we can go into the other example. There was one uh, small question by Inu Mai who said, how do you figure out how much to actually train when you're trying to apply interp interpolation? Yeah, yeah. So that that's a great question. I think this ultimately... Um, I think this ultimately depends on what your goals are, 
right? Um, for example, if you want uh, something that's highly separable in terms of um, you want to assign very high probability of going right or going left until such a time you hit the center and then over here you want very high probability of moving right, right? Then you're going to want to train a lot, right? For example, even this, I kind of maxed it out what I would probably do is save it and then do another training session to reinforce it so that there is high separation along here. Now, not everyone wants high separation there, right? So if you don't, then you might want to train a little bit less, right? Maybe you don't want this slope, for example, that goes into the activation function to be so massive um, that it's going to cause large separation. Maybe you want something a little flatter, right? Maybe you want, um, like, almost like an unknown probability like here like almost like equal probability along most of the mid range right and then you want um it to certainly go right over here and then basically probability start even out within like the three quarters um it's ultimately up to you right if you don't want such like a heavy heavy um i don't want to call it bias because it's not a bias but if you don't want kind of like very, very, very large probabilities for a single action, then I would tend to train a little kind of less intense, if you know what I mean. Um, but if you're very fine and you're like, no, in every single time that it's in this situation, I always want it to go to the left, then cer certainly um, I, I would train very, very intensely for that. Um, but of course, you have to be careful that this doesn't override uh, what it does in other states. Right, because that could sometimes happen when you just show it one thing and you really overfit to that one thing. What could happen is that it overrides what it does in a lot of other states. And of course, we're doing a lot of fundamental research um, to not make this happen. Uh, and our next patch is going to really help with this. Um, but it is still a risk at the end of the day because of the fact that we're dealing with connectionist models. Right. So, for example, sorry, I always forget you guys can't see my mouse. Um, because we're dealing with connectionist models, right? So like these like weights over here. So for example, let's say this weight over here, right, was very important to going back to the center of the stage, right? And then you do another training session um, to practice combat. And because of the natural course of things, when you're updating a neural network, you tend to update all the weights. You change this weight, right? So let's say um, let's call it like W12 goes to W12 prime, right? So it changed, right? Because it changed, now the probability over here will change, right? Because that weight was very important in basically uh, determining this probability, right? And so there's, it's really hard to get around this. We're doing a lot of really cool research um, for figuring out which weights are most important Right there's there's some like um, papers published and we're kind of building on those papers internally um, to figure out what weights are most important for certain tasks, right? Um, but even with that research, over time um, you you are going to override these weights because there's just no escaping it. Eventually, all weights are going to be important for some tasks, and if you want to change the neural network, you're going to have to change the weights. Um, so it's just being cognizant of that and trying to figure out how to train in a way to preserve what you care about uh, while also introducing the new the new actions, essentially. Um, I hope that makes sense. I'm taking silence as it does make sense. <laughs> so I am going to show you guys basically how to train an action because someone asked about it. And I'm going to show you actually one of the really cool things about the concept of interpolation um, and why it potentially could make your AI better than you. Um, so I'll hop into training over here. Um, and I'm going to do something really simple. I just want to show my AI uh, basically to uh, do the down attack when you're above the opponent and then do some up attacks when you're below it, right? So I'm just going to do this, and that's it. Um, I just collected data, just doing down attack when I was above it, and then when it was above me, I just did some up attacks. I'm just going to end over here. Same thing as before, we're going to bump up epochs 
uh, we're just going to basically intentionally overfit just to show the point. And I'm only going to train on the angle to the opponent. Now, for those who are not sure what this is, basically um, what we're doing is we are tracking where the opponent is relative to us, right? So if they are below us, then we're going to know that they're below us. Um, and then if they are above us, then we're going to know that they're above us. And so that's the input that the AI is getting. And so it should alter its actions depending on this. Um, one thing I will note for those who are keen enough to observe is that um, there's a big discrepancy when you just move the, the opponent a little bit. It goes from 0 degrees to 360 degrees. This is a problem when using um, degrees, basically like a one-dimensional degree as an input. So obviously, we account for that. Uh, we are cognizant of this. And so we use both the sine and cosine of the radian to preserve continuity of this, um, of the of the angle. If anyone's interested in this, hit me up afterwards. We'll share some great resources in terms of why this works. Um, also, you can just feed these numbers into sine and cosine, and you can see that they work, that they preserve continuity. Um, but yeah, that's essentially what we're focusing on over here. And I will train the model. And then let's see if it learned what we wanted it to. And it did. So you see here, um, I just showed it one example, right? It was hitting it when it was up. And then I was hitting it when it was down. And it learned what we showed it, right? It did the down attack when it, the enemy is below us. And it did the up attack when the enemy was above us. Um, now you'll see that it's a really smooth transition in the probabilities, right? And it's because what's happening is the probabilities, right? There's interpolation happening over here, right? The probabilities are being interpolated. Um, I only showed it this and this. So how can it learn the other stuff? It's because of what I showed you guys earlier, right? It's a connectionist model. Um, so it's, it's not something discrete. So I think what some people think of when they think of AI is it's almost like a decision tree. Right, uh, which is it's a separate type of machine learning model, but that that's not what we're doing over here. So what what some people might think of is they might think like you have this kind of like um, root node, and then there are these conditions, right, to execute like go left uh, if x um, is greater than zero, and then right if x is less than zero. That's not what's happening over here. We're not using a, a decision tree. We don't have these discrete rules. Rather, we use a bunch of math, which is just uh, linear equations passed through some nonlinearities multiple times, right? Um, and that's what happens. And because of that, then you get this cool interpolation where I can only show it basically a couple things, and then it'll learn what to do in the in-between states. Um, of course, what it learns in the in-between states is not always what you want, um, but it sometimes could really like alleviate showing it what to do in every single possible scenario. Right now, you could just show it what to do in a few key scenarios, see how it interpolates. If it interpolates in a way that you do not like, then of course, you can go back into training and show it what to do in that specific scenario. But this was an example of you kind of showing it what to do twice, and it learned how to interpolate into all these different states, which I think is really cool. And now, to get to the point I mentioned earlier on this concept of your AI being better than you, um, this is actually one of uh, the really cool things about interpolation. And I admit I'm, I'm guilty of this sometimes where I see my AI pulling off something that um, is really hard for me to do. Um, and it's because of interpolation, because you don't have to time things perfectly. And I'll show you what I mean. So imagine your opponent is coming at you, and you want to down smash. Um, and so sometimes what happened is I would go too early, and I would miss them. right? And then other times I would go too late, and I would miss them on the other side. And what my AI learned is like, OK, I learned what to do when you're too early, when you're too late. If you interpolate, you can get it just right. Right, so now you're able to basically do the down attack within this range, right? Even though I I never showed it how to do it when I actually timed it right, I missed every time. 
but sometimes I was early, sometimes I was late, but my AI interpolated and was able to actually time it correctly, which is very, very cool if you ask me. So what that means is that you just kind of have to have a good theoretical understanding of how the game works, right? And even if your timing is not immaculate, you can still teach an AI um, to basically play the game well, and in fact, sometimes better than yourself. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just pause here to see if anybody has any questions on that. Doesn't look like we have a question, but um, personally, I, I do have one, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, since you're mentioning it, would it, let's say there, there's like a, two type of uh, training set you can do. One, one set is like you do it like a down smash. You do it perfectly, like uh, directly above the opponent, which is a mm. perfect training. Versus, like you mentioned, if I want to, uh, you know, because the frame of attack is definitely larger. You don't have to be per perfectly above them. If I'm mm. on the maximum range to the right side and the maximum range to the left side, and I tra train it on equal time on both sides, a down smash, would it theoretically change like a better outcome? Since like a, ah. I'm covering more range in, in this sense, so it doesn't have to be directly above opponent for it to mm. do an effective down smash. That is a great question. So you're you're saying basically the opponent's here. You're here. You do a down smash. You're here. You do a down smash. Or maybe even closer, like uh, may, maybe like a slight slightly on top of the head. But not directly above. Yeah, something like that. You would like still that, connect. Right? Yeah, you still connect, but like uh, it, you don't have to be directly above. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's that's actually preferred, right? Uh, because you're covering more range of the different areas that that you can hit, uh, versus just just this area. I think it's better to cover like this range than than just here. However, I will note because everything is continuous. Um, if you're able to time things perfectly, it's it's obviously great because then what you can do is you can try really training a lot and you can make it almost like a discrete cutoff. Even though I said things can't be discrete, but it can be like pseudo discrete, right? Where you imagine you make the slope really steep kind of around this area. And of course, the farther out you push it, right, you're still going to have almost like a little buffer because everything is continuous. So there is some transition from... Um, basically this to like, if you were to do like going left, for example, right? It's, it's not discrete. Um, so the larger range you create, um, ultimately the more buffer you'll have, cause it's not, for example, if you show it from here to here, it's not just going to stop from here to here. It's going to probably create a buffer from here to here, right? Versus if you just show it on top, then it might create a buffer from here to here, if that makes sense. I hope I'm making see, sense, yeah. but it's just because it's continuous and it needs um, the probability to transition, right? Uh, and so it's sometimes it might be a slow transition like here, and sometimes it might be a really quick transition depending on how you trained. I see, I see. Got it. Cool. And, and, and I would assume the, the transition uh, effect that you mentioned here uh, tied to a certain focus area, like angle to opponent, distance to opponent, but for something like action representation, mm. it would be very discrete, right? So, so yes, yes, yes. That that is a great point. Um, that that that's an excellent point. Like for example, I'm sure if I do this, and then this, you see that as soon as I kind of oops, as soon as I switch this, now the probabilities just like discreetly changed versus if I just move the opponent, it's a lot more continuous. The reason for that, like you mentioned, is because the inputs are discrete, right? In, in this case, the X was continuous, right? But what, sorry, I always forget that you guys can't see my mouse. Um, I'll, I'll use the red. So in this case, actually green, in this case, the X, the X is continuous over here, right? It like goes along this whole line. But what happens if it was either this or this, right? Now, 
it's it's a lot more discreet. You're not going to have that smooth transition. And and we do have certain features that are very discreet like this. So like you mentioned, the action representation. Another one is the direction, right? You see that direction is like a discrete transform of the probabilities, right? Um, but of course, position change is different. Position change is more discrete. Um, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense. So yeah, this one, for example, is more continuous. And so you see sort of like the flex over here is a lot smoother um, than, than something like this. Uh, yep, that's a really good uh, intuition. So thanks for that. Awesome. No problem. No problem. Great question. Anyone else have any questions? I know we're running up on time. I hope um, this wasn't too technical, but um, I, I really, really hope this makes sense for you guys. Uh, this is essentially what's what's happening. Um, is when you show it what to do in certain scenarios, it kind of makes, this is basically what happens when it alters the value of, of W is that it adjusts these slopes. Um, and yeah, and the further and further, the more and more you train, the further and further it, it kind of gets away from the zero mark and the larger these get, which ultimately increase um, the appearance of something being discrete, even though it's not actually discrete, increases the appearance of it being discrete because the probabilities get so large, as you see over here. But yeah, if there's no other questions, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, as much as I did. And, and of course, if you have any questions, just drop them in, in Discord, and um, I'm happy to answer there. All right. Thank you guys. Uh, let's. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube afterward. I know this time is a bit more technical. Definitely uh, go check it out. And uh, this will be on the quiz next week. So another chance for you to earn the four thousand AP. So let's uh, stay tuned to it. And uh, afterward today we will have the artist contest, like uh, the the winner for the official fan art event. So looking forward to that as well. So thank you for uh, Brandon. For the, for the lesson and thank you for you guys for supporting us we'll see you guys again same time next week cheers yeah thanks guys this is great yeah